Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming back from lunch. Um, it's always the great job to be told that you're on just after lunch. I don't know which is worse, being before lunch, which is before people actually go and eat, or being the one that's got to try and give people energy and get people excited and motivated about security. Woo! Thank you. Uh, <laughs> What I would say on this, um, so security, it's on everyone's lips now. I think everyone's talking about security. It's in the mainstream media. It's fantastic. Uh, the takeaway I want you to, to really leave from here is get up to date and use two-factor authentication. If you remember two things, those two things, please, get up to date and use two-factor authentication. So if you'd like to leave now. Uh, so does everyone remember a company called Card System Solutions? They were one of the biggest processors of card uh, transactions in the US. They were processing millions of transactions a day and billions of dollars uh, of value per day. In 2005, they were using Windows Server 2000. Uh, they were using IIS 5. And they were taking an interesting approach to data capture and data retention. They were simply retaining all data, which they weren't allowed to do. Uh, they were not encrypting data, which, again, breaks MasterCard rules and Visa rules. And the short of it was they, they had, at the time, the biggest breach that had ever been seen of 40 million records. 40 million customer records. They no longer exist. And if you go onto Wikipedia, there's a great little thing saying, you know, card system solutions were, and then talk about the biggest breaches. Then you click on through Wikipedia and go to the next biggest breaches. And you see all this information about the next one up were the biggest, the next one up was the biggest. And again, just, I know we're talking at a different order of scale here, but this is an existential threat and has been for the last decade for everyone. I'm glad that everyone is now talking about security. What's our job? Our job in the security industry, come on. Right, we're back to manual technology. Our job in the security industry is to make attackers' lives harder. Security and attacking and hacking, and that isn't just technical compromise, that's identity compromise, any form of compromise, is no longer people sitting in the basement with their hoodie on and, you know, you all see Mr. Robot, is trying to do something to get money. If we can disrupt their return on investment, they won't bother. The low-hanging fruit, the big guys are still getting attacked, but they're also looking at the small guys, and I'll come on to a story about that later. If you do six things, so I've already asked you to do two. If you do six things, let's get cyber hygiene right. The first one of these genuinely depresses me. Um, at Microsoft, as you know, we update, well, it's over 1.2 billion devices a month through Windows Update. Would you like to hazard a guess at what percentage of devices in the UK come to us for an update that don't have an antivirus running, so it's either disabled, or their antivirus signatures are more than 30 days old? Not just Microsoft stuff, any antivirus solution. Any guesses? 5%? 10%? 50? That's, thankfully, it's not quite that bad. It's 20%. One in five devices is connecting and getting updates that isn't up to date on its AV. Again, this, this is like, for me, going out and driving on Silverstone without a crash helmet or a seatbelt on. You will get dead. It's not good luck. The second point, um, show of hands in the room, who runs as admin, local admin on their machine? I don't believe you. Yeah, thank you for the honesty. It's 2018. You don't need to do this. There's better ways of doing things. You know what apps people need to run. You know what you need to run. When was the last time you installed an app that wasn't sanctioned by IT. Why are you running as admin? It is such a simple thing to do, but if you do run as admin, you're giving the attackers who will compromise someone in your organization, no matter how big, how small, the keys to the domain. And I use that word very deliberately. This is the way people compromise on a big scale. Admin rights is what people are looking for and then looking to use the lateral, um, lateral motion and escalation. Third thing, whitelisting. This one is more difficult, really, I think. Uh, but it is what the Australian NCSC is the biggest uh, thing you can do to better protect your organization, whitelisting apps. So know what you're allowing to run on your devices and have a process for how people can actually go and re request an exception to that. And that's very much around the fourth point as well, which is end user guidance. Make sure you are using the end user guidance that's out there. We work closely with the NCSC uh, they take our best practice, they take our advice, they then edit it, change it, add their best practice, and there is some great stuff 
that all of us in the room have paid for as UK taxpayers on the National Cyber Security Centre's website around end user device guidance. I cannot reinstate this enough. Go out, use it. It's brilliant. It's really, really good. And it's easy to consume. Then patching. Almost the final one on this slide. My colleague, Stuart Aston, is the National Security Officer for Microsoft. And I think if anyone was in the room when he was presenting this, the first two tables would now be sort of wiping themselves down because he foams at the mouth talking about this. This gets him angry. Patching is the single most important thing that you can do in his eyes to keep the bad guys out. Does anyone, anyone hear of this small little thing called WannaCry last year? Anyone remember it? Would you like to guess that in a large health provider organization, what the most commonly compromised machine type was, the most common OS that was compromised was? Windows 7. Windows 7, for which a patch had been available that would have stopped this from working. That is the biggest story on why you get patched. I understand it. We understand it. We know that there's different ways of working that, I've tried to use that again and it's not worked. There's different ways of working that mean that you probably have a reason <laughs> for not patching. That was valid 10 years ago, five years ago. The world has changed. The way patches are delivered has changed. The way you manage your systems should be changing. Does anyone use, um, so as an example, does anyone still use an iPhone 3GS? Okay. Does anyone use Windows 7 anywhere in their estate? The iPhone 3GS came out the year before Windows 7 and wasn't replaced. When you were buying your Windows 7 machines for the first time, you could also go out and buy an iPhone 3GS. Why do you not accept that in your home life or in your, on your phone, but you're quite happy to do it in your personal life or in your work life? If the answer is app compatibility, there's ways to approach that. There's great stuff that was announced last week at Ignite around how to run virtualized copies of Windows 7 to make sure you don't have to. There is such good reasons for patching. The other point about patching is have an approach that you know will work. And the keyboard's died as well now, which makes it even more interesting. Have an approach that will work. People often accuse Microsoft saying, ah, you're using us as the beta testers. Guess what, population? You're not the beta testers. It's the people inside Microsoft that get stuff first. We run this stuff internally before it gets out in the wild. And there's many different layers. But the approach we take is by using these different rings. Has everyone heard of the idea of rings with Office 365 or rings within Windows? The idea of getting out a few devices, your canary devices, where you roll out a patch on day one and you look to see if everything's good. You can get the tele telemetry to let you know if this is working or what the problems are. All good, roll out on day two. Continue to roll out day three, continue to roll out on day four, and be patched within a week. That is the target that I'd like everyone in this room to say, do you know what, I think I can do that. The approach needed here is a different approach. Up until now, we've seen IT departments for every right reason saying, what we're going to do is we're going to take every patch and every change on our devices, and we're going to look to see what it does. And within 30 to 60 days, we'll then look to roll out that patch. We'll push the big green button, which is the release button. We'd like you to take a different approach, which is to go through these ring ideas to say, look, plan to roll back, but get stuff out there. And instead of the big green button, have a big red button that says, hang on a minute, something's gone wrong. Take that approach rather than the, uh, the approach of just assuming you've got a regression test every single thing. I know that is a big change. It is a big culture change, and it's a big change within IT. Where do SMBs think they are in this? SMBs all are worried about cybersecurity. Um, show of hands, anyone in here who's not worried about cybersecurity? And again, I actually like the definition from Mimecast of talking about cyber resilience as well as cybersecurity. Anyone not worried? I'm going to change this slide for 100%. How many would say it's a top priority for them right now? A top priority across business and everything. Interesting. So a bit under the 56% the on here. I, I think that is an interesting start. And again, it comes from a, a lot of survey of which you'll find more information in the uh, links. Then we ask what people are doing and how they think they're protected. And we get 90% of SMBs telling us they have the right security systems in place. Again, I really like the, the Mimecast approach here of looking at the recoverability. Because we, 
and, and it isn't by any means unique. We try to get people to think about not only protecting everything that they do and protecting information, protecting users, protecting devices, all that good stuff, but detecting what's going on. And I, I see a previous uh, speaker's comment about not going towards the back. This could be amusing if we carry on like this. Detecting what's going on, seeing what's out there. If you don't look for problems, you won't find them. And then responding, how are you going to respond? And again, 90% said they got on protect, 80% said they got on detect, and 83% said they got on respond. However, 41% of SMBs have been hacked. They've had a compromise of some form. The, the statistics don't match the feeling. When we look at this, is, is anyone using Microsoft 365 or Office 365 at the moment? Good, thank you. Um, is anyone an admin? Or again, I, I guess we might not be talking to admin. A few admins, great. There's this thing called Microsoft Secure Score. It used to be called Office 365 Secure Score, which tells you how well you're securing your, you're securing your tenants and how your operations are compared to what we consider best practice. There's a load of simple things, and if you go into your admin portal, you will see, and click on Secure Score, you'll see a list of things that you can do to simply protect your, uh, your tenant better and your employees better. The first thing, pretty much on every time I've seen Secure Score, is it says, you need to make sure your global admins are secured with two-factor authentication. So any global admins in the room? Have you got two-factor authentication turned on? Thank you. Thank you. Good. Well done. You've got a better secure score than the majority of people in this survey. Secure score then tells you what you can do to be better and benchmarks you. And, and again, what we've found is out of the box when you, you, you look at uh, Microsoft 365, you typically have a secure score of around 80 or 90, just without doing anything. Highest score we've seen so far is 267, but the average SMB secure score, and this learns over time, this sees that you're not actually looking at reports, you're not acting on incidents, and it drops your secure score down. The average is 39. So people are feeling protected, they feel they've got the investment, but they're not <laughs> actually living it. The second point, the average business, and this is including um, enterprises, the average business in our surveys has found that people have 60 different cybersecurity solutions. That's a challenge in itself, but looking at SMBs and finding that they have an average of eight cybersecurity solutions gets us questioning, hang on a minute, are people actually secure? They think they're secure, but they're being hacked. And I think we need to make sure we are helping people simply get more secure. And yes, the answer is sometimes point solutions. The answer is sometimes, you know, looking to see what else you can do to make yourself better protected. But you need to know to look where you're going to spend the money. And it's great. We see everyone's got endpoint antivirus software. People who are investing in anti-phishing software. People who are investing in encryption, DLP, all this stuff. And we're seeing that, again, software's kept up to date in 64%, two-thirds. That worries me. Employees are using strong and unique passwords. And again, this is a survey. Has anyone heard of haveibeenpwned.com? If you haven't, go to haveibeenpwned.com. It's have I been owned, but with a P instead of an O, uh, .com, and enter your email address. And look on in horror as you see how many data dumps your email address has been in. I've had the same email address for about 20 years now. And um, yeah, it, it's depressing to see exactly where this has been. LinkedIn, um, Adobe, you name it, it it's out there. The other scary thing and terrifying thing that Have I Been Pwned has just released is, or released a few months ago, is a password data dump. These aren't just password hashes, these are the raw passwords. These are the unencrypted passwords. It's now a 10 point something gig download. So there's over, again, it's billions of records compromised and billions of passwords available. So are people really using strong and unique passwords? I would challenge that. Yeah, process in place, all this good stuff. But what are we seeing? What's the reality? What do we actually see going on? And at Microsoft, we get loads of signal. Every vendor in the room will talk about trillions of signals that we act on and have machine learning on. You know, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm done with these because every security vendor has the signal. What makes it more interesting for me is a case that we had last month where we found a new type of malware that was specifically attacking 200 individuals in the states across 12 different cities. 
There's a write-up on this if you go to aka.ms slash 918ISG, uh, and there's a recording, so hopefully that will come through for people, um, which explains what was happening. Fundamentally, those 200 people were being targeted by a phishing scam um, with a spoof Office 365 login that you would be directed to after you enabled macros within uh, a document that you'd been supposedly sent. When you enabled those macros, in the background, what would happen is um, uh, a downloader, a malware downloader, a Trojan would be installed on your machine. That's it. You're now part of a command and conquer network, a command and control network. So the point is, yes, we've got these billions and trillions of signals. The interesting thing is that we make these signals work, and that out of well, many different machine learning models running over those signals, four independently popped up saying there's something wrong in these cases and allowed us to classify that and stop the threat and get in contact with these people. If you remember back that slide, a couple of, a couple of slides back, we saw that people were invested in antivirus, anti-phishing. What we see at Microsoft is month on month, Microsoft cloud attacks are going up by 300% year on year. This is the low-hanging fruit. So we can talk about putting as much email security as we want in. We can talk about as putting as much. Having everything. Fundamentally, you can build the highest wall and the best wall and the strongest wall, whatever. But if you've left the keys to the back gate out there and your employees are out there using insecure passwords, you're going to get compromised. Not through a technical means, not through a zero day, just from identity being compromised. Again, that's why I'm saying two-factor authentication and patching, the big things you can take away from this. So we see day in, day out, that 81% of breaches are caused by credential theft. That have I been pwned I mentioned before? Guess what? The bad guys are doing it. Uh, again, I, I don't want to go on about fear and raising, you know, the, oh, the hackers are out there trying to hack you. But credentials are for sale on the dark web. You can go out and buy, I dare say there's people in the Microsoft.com domain name that you can try and buy their credentials on the dark web. You can buy root kits for $150. You can buy, add a Trojan to that for $150. You could add an extra screen viewing um, capability with TeamViewer for $150. Again, you can build your own root kit that's never been seen before. But identity is the lowest hanging fruit. 73% of passwords are duplicate. Can we have a show of hands in the room from everyone who honestly doesn't reuse a password anywhere else? You will have a moment, each of us will have a moment where you suddenly get this alert saying, strange activity on your account, Mr. Lines. Have you really been in Thailand? And at that point, you'll turn on two-factor authentication if you haven't before. But please turn on two-factor authentication. Uh, that, again, gets rid of the problems with duplicates. And, and yes, two-factor authentication with mobile isn't perfect, but it is a hell of a lot better than just using passwords. And people use non-approved apps. People come to work and they bring their own services. That's to be expected. If we don't provide the best service for them, if we don't provide the right tools for them, they'll go and do that. Little bit about Windows 10. So where have we been with Windows 10? Windows 10 came out, what, 2017, 1709 was the first release that uh, was popular, I think. No, it didn't. Sorry, 1509 was the first pop release that was popular. From that time, this is all the stuff that has been added on. So this is a, a not-so-subtle message to say, get onto Windows 10, yes, but then change your cadence so you're not just taking the releases that happen, well, get to Windows 10 and then assume that you'll upgrade when Windows 11 is coming out, because that's not going to happen. You need to change the way you're approaching patching and approaching upgrades. Because what we've been adding in the anniversary update, Windows Information Protection, Windows Hello, Katana for Business, Windows Inc., Store for Business, Upgrade Analytics, to help you know what's going on. And that's in the anniversary update. Look at the creators update. We're adding Windows Current. You can read the slide. Point is, all of this stuff is coming out. <coughs> as well as the security patches, these are just feature releases. To really hammer home the point, these are the features that have been added in each Windows release, not security patches. These are the features that have been added. There's a load of good stuff in there around security. If we look at 1703, Windows Defender ATP, Windows Defender Security Center. Look in here, Windows Defender Exploit Guard, System Guard, Application Guard. All of this stuff gives you better security and gives you more control of your device. Get to green. Get on that journey. 
It's not just about security, though. So getting green, getting current, and giving people the right device means that people will actually stay with you and, and want to be with you because they feel valued. The one I find interesting is the two in five here. I, I didn't quite believe it, I must admit, but I was at an event a couple of weeks back um, uh, at the Shard when I was presenting this slide and again made the comment that I'm not quite sure this is right. I had a, a couple of people from a construction company come in and tell me about their latest graduate recruitment scheme where they'd lost three people within two weeks. The reason being is that the IT that they gave them wasn't that good. And again, you don't expect to come in and get an iPhone 3GS. Make sure you're giving people the right tools for the job to get the job done. So that was really the bit about security. I think the other thing I want to mention on security is complexity is the enemy of security. Keep it simple. Make it simple. That's what we understand. That's what we need to help. Um, at Microsoft, we do like to show off how clever we are sometimes and show how the breadth of the solutions we have and how wonderful we have in depth and how we've got this, that, and the other. Thankfully, people have woken up, and we now realize that simplicity is what the SMB market needs, what you need, because you haven't got a team of IT support that you can call on a day in, day out. You need to make sure that this is easy. So you need to keep your technology up to date. You need to support a mobile distributor workforce. You need to protect sensitive data, and I think we all know why that is. And you need to protect against cyber threats and phishing schemes. This is why we've launched this thing called Microsoft 365 Business. So I'm aware that this is a bit producty now, so uh, if you'd like to boo me off, feel free to. Uh, but I want to keep this interesting and informative for you. What this tries to do is package up all the different stuff we've had, make it appropriate for SMBs, and it hit your challenges head on. So getting more stuff done, working better together, building the business out, give you the packages you need to actually get out there and do stuff. I think the interesting thing on this is, yes, you get more done. Yes, you work better together. Yes, you build your business. But you've got the safeguards. This is like the platform piece. This is, this is the givens that you need. You need to be able to safeguard your business. That means from security threats. That means information protection. That means, again, making sure you're not going to be holding in front of the regulator. And if you do, you can actually have a good conversation. And make it simple. Again, complexity, enemy of security, make it simple. Um, how many people are actually using the current version of Office? Which is great when it actually listens and, and wants to advance the slide. There we go. It's come through. Um, how many people are using the current version of Office, the Pro Plus version of Office? Fantastic. Okay. Has anyone used or seen PowerPoint Designer yet? A couple of hands in the room. This thing for me is great. You chuck a picture on a, on a screen. You chuck a couple of words of text on a screen. And it starts suggesting what you might want to do with that to make it look better. I am not a graphic designer, and it can make my slides look a lot better than they did. My sons, who, uh, again, are starting to make presentations for school, are loving this because it makes stuff look professional without having a graphic design team in-house. This is what we say when we're trying to get intelligent tools to help you do your job. It's to try and get out there and make the best of what you can do. Again, work on the go. Uh, we're here to talk about security, so I'll not drain this, but you can find out more later. What I do like, does everyone love Outlook? Everyone love email? Really? I personally don't like email. I think it is an awful way of communication. I think it's an awful way of getting jobs done. It's not a way to engage my colleagues. It's one of those that, again, and I'm guilty of this as well, you, you think something's done when you've sent an email. I, it isn't. What I do like is the way that the the way that we are trying to pivot the way people work to be around collaboration. You've all seen those stats around how people are working in more teams than they ever were before, how people are working in more virtual teams that are geographically dispersed, and again, for SMBs or, or whoever, we are seeing this. You need to get the right skills to get your team together to get a job done. Teams allows you to do that. And what I find fascinating is it's changing the culture within Microsoft. It is changing the way we work. It is getting people to work in the open. It is getting people to actually, by default, reach out and work with others rather than this idea of individual excellence. There's a whole, whole talk I could give around how the culture in Microsoft has changed since Satya Nadella has become our CEO. I'd say that this is a really good example of it made real. People are working together. It's not an idea of individual expertise. It's an idea of 
everyone coming on board and everyone getting up to, uh, to be able to collaborate in the same way. We also talk about building your business. So for this, you need certain tools. Again, you need CRM. You need uh, a schedule and management and booking system. Again, <laughs> I actually really like the booking system in here because I find it easier to use than the one we get with our enterprise booking system within Microsoft. It allows you to very simply find times in people's diaries, even if you can't see their diaries. It's a work of genius. And finally, very simply, you've got planner in there as well. Data safeguarding, I do want to spend a little bit more time on this because this for me is a huge advantage of Microsoft 365 business. Um, we've had people describing uh, you know, this idea of sandboxing for your uh, email attachments, so the idea of running in a virtual environment, spinning up a virtual environment, hiding that this is in a virtual environment before you launch an attachment into that virtual environment and see what it does, look for network, look for memory, look for weirdness happening to system files. You get that with Microsoft Office 365, uh, sorry, Microsoft 365 Business. You get Office 365 ATP. Um, you also get Azure Information Protection, which allows you to classify your data and then put appropriate rules around that data to make sure that it goes encrypted if it ever leaves your company, that it's encrypted in the first place, that it's watermarked. Again, you've got this idea that you can optionally let people classify or you can mandate that people classify information. So it's a simple little thing, but that can be the cornerstone of how you start to approach GDPR compliance. And you can control data access. So if someone's coming in and accessing this information, you know where they're coming from. You can tell where, they're, uh, where they've been, and you can revoke that access should you want to in the future. You get this idea of phishing protection from the real-time click. So when you click through, rather than actually going straight onto a website from the link, the link is... Uh, sent through the, the verification service, and we then see if we should send you there or not. An interesting statistic, there's something like, um, it's nine out of a thousand websites in a recent survey that Microsoft has done have been found to host phishing attacks. Nine out of a thousand. That genuinely surprised me on the whole of the web. And if you're interested in that sort of thing and you're interested in finding out more, if you go to aka.ms slash sir, the security incident report, which Microsoft publishes every six months. There's a load more in there. Again, if, if you're a security geek, I'll see you in three days, because there's so much in there to digest. It's, it's really, really useful. Yeah, that's what's behind this anyhow, the idea of uh, you know, going out and stopping you from going through and, and protecting users from themselves, really. Uh, on the idea of, of information protection, I think we, we had this conversation as well, and other people have made this point, that if you try and make things hard, if you try and put controls in place and stop people from doing everything, guess what? They'll find a way around it. Everyone in this room has got a mobile phone. Everyone in this room has a phone with a camera on it. Everyone in this room can pick up their phone, point their camera at their computer screen, and take a photograph of it when it's got the most protected information marked with watermarks. It still is there. We are assuming that people want to do the right thing and they want to get the job done. So we are helping them to get the job done by saying, hang on a minute, it looks like you might be sensing sensitive information. Do you really want to do this? And again, you as administrators can then take the decision to say, we've identified something that possibly is protected by data loss prevention rules. Do we want to let them send this? Do we want to warn them? Do we want to monitor this and just keep it under our hats? Or do we want to block it? If you block it, they'll find another way of sending it. But what you will do is cause people to think. You'll cause people to say, hang on a minute, didn't realize that, do I actually want to do this? If you get the wrong person as well, the following recipient is outside your organization. Just a simple thing, I think we've all done it, where we've, we've tried to send an email to someone and inadvertently got the wrong person in our contact list. Again, just little tooltips to help people do the right thing. In terms of what you get for the device access, again, you can require a PIN, you can require fingerprint data, you can remotely wipe your devices should you want to, and that was almost a comedy moment as well. Um, you can apply encryption, you can apply restrictions. But what we want to do is make things simple. Then we'll here maintain an image for their Windows machines that they burn out and, yeah. It's, it's the gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? The, maintaining a Windows image is just lovely. We're trying to get you away from that with this idea of stuff called autopilot. Have you heard of autopilot? 
Brilliant. You've heard of it. Again, this comes with the Microsoft 365 business. Fundamentally, it allows you to get a device, um, register that device at, at time of purchase, and then when your employee comes in, opens up their device on any network and enters their credentials, the necessary protection, the necessary software gets streamed down for them, and they're configured and ready to go and join to the domain. It is trying to give you an easier way to work than maintaining those gold images, keeping them up to date. Whenever there's a patch, you need to update your gold image, all that sort of stuff. We're trying to help you get away from that. So this is what 365 powered devices that we talk about. It gives you the security, it gives you, again. Let's get back to talking about security. Remember these things? Goodness. Remember these things? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. There is life. Um, again, AV, just do it. Don't run as admin. And I would challenge everyone in here to take that away as an action who is running as admin. Why are you doing it? I know there's a little feeling of power. If you of power, I'm still admin on my machine. You don't need it. Work out a way around it. Um, whitelisting, again, I don't understand if there's some pushback on that one, to be honest, but uh, I think that is an easy way to take the low-hanging fruit out. Use the guidance that's out there that we've all paid for. Get patching. If there's one, th I keep on saying if there's one thing to take away from this. It's about 15 different one things to take away from this. Patching, patching, patching. Get there. Finally, identity. Two-factor authentication is not perfect, but it can take you a hell of a low way closer to protecting against the threats that are actually out there and being seen. I was delighted this morning when Jason started talking about Article 32. It is my favorite article. The reason being for exactly the words that Jason said, taking into account state of the art. State of the art isn't Windows 7 and, Windows, uh, and Office 2010. Again, that sounds like a a trite pitch, but what I want you to do is consider those words every time you're doing something. Every time you're having a conversation with someone and they're saying, hang on a minute, are you really sure we need to do this? Or do we really need to change? Think of what state of the art might be and where you are. And it might be that you don't know what state of the art is. I certainly can't keep up to date with all the volume of stuff that's happening in the security industry. But that is where you need to be. You need to be considering what's going on. And finally, never waste a good crisis. I am looking forward to seeing what happens with BA, and we've been discussing this with a few people in the room, actually. Look at what happened with um, Equifax. They had a breach in 2017, and we eventually found out about it anything between the six and 18 months later, depending on who you believe. Look at what happened to BA. They had a breach in August, and we found about, out about it very early in September. By that time, everyone who'd been affected had been contacted the card issuing banks and be told to reissue debit cards and credit cards. Stuff had happened. The market has changed for the better. So what I would say on this, use this. Everyone's talking about security. Never waste a good crisis. Have it as a reason to have a conversation with security or with everyone in your business to change the culture. So you're starting to consider how you can adopt a culture of security within an organization. I really like the point made earlier as well um, uh, around this idea of, of the, the fair blame culture. So again, create the culture where people will come and talk to you when they think they've done something wrong. Go and fish your own, run a phishing attack, run a phishing simulation on your own um, staff. We at Microsoft had one just three days ago, actually. And it was, it was fairly good, but it was, it was a proper looking phishing attack. There were spelling mistakes in it, there was click here to recover your account, all that sort of stuff. Point is, never waste a good crisis. Go and change your security posture. Turn on two-factor authentication and get patching. Any questions? All well, the investment is going into, uh, Sky, uh, going into Teams, certainly. So you're seeing a huge amount of investment in Teams. Skype for Business isn't going to go anywhere soon, particularly on-prem, if that's where you're running it. But if you're... Uh, if you're looking to use cloud voice or even just cloud collaboration, Teams for me is where you should be, uh, where you should be looking. We now, have par sorry, we now have parity as well between the Skype for Business features and the Teams features, which I think was a, a really important piece. Mm -hmm.